You're listening to the REI Marketing Nerds Podcast, the leading resource for real estate investors who want to dominate their market online. Dan Barrett is the founder of AdWords Nerds, a high-tech digital agency focusing exclusively on helping real estate investors like you get more leads and deals online, outsmart your competition, and live a freer, more awesome life. And now, your host, Dan Barrett. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the REI Marketing Nerds Podcast. As always, this is Daniel Barrett here from AdWordsNerds.com. And if you need more leads and deals online for your real estate investing business, as always, you know where to go. It's AdWordsNerds.com. You can go to get a free call with someone on my team and they will help you put together an online marketing strategy for your real estate investing business. Okay, this week, folks, we have a a really, really awesome interview with Ed Matthews. Now, if you don't know Ed, he was the, uh, you know, one of the sort of main people behind the CT RIA. He is an investor here in Connecticut, where I am actually located. One of the few investors that I've ever interviewed from Connecticut, which is pretty awesome. Um, but he was the head of the CT RIA for a long time and is now one of the sort of most influential investors in Connecticut doing multifamily syndication. He's got an incredible podcast called The Real Estate Underground. But here's the thing that I think really makes Ed stand apart from most real estate investors. First of all, an incredibly kind, giving, a welcoming person, right? You can really tell after talking to Ed why he could be uh, behind something like a RIA for so long, because he is dedicated to helping real estate investors figure out this industry. So he is one of these people that is just a true go-giver, someone who is willing to put himself out there to help people. He's got a tech background, which makes him an awesome talk, you know, awesome conversation for someone like me. And He's really amazing at explaining what goes into something like multifamily syndication, right? He makes these topics approachable. He makes them seem doable. He is just one of the most legit people I've ever had on this show. I cannot wait for you to get to meet Ed Matthews. So without any further ado, let's jump into the interview. I am here with Ed Matthews. Ed, you may have heard from the Real Estate Underground podcast, which you can get over at realestateundergroundpodcast.com. Ed, welcome to the show, man. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks, Dan. Great to see it. We were talking about this very briefly before, but you are one of the only investors I have ever had in my home state of Connecticut. So I am very happy, very proud to have you here. Connecticut is like strangely underrepresented. <laughs> It, it really is. Yeah. Passing. Yeah. So uh, I want to dig into that, but let's talk yeah. about you today. I want to give people kind of like the overview. So for people who aren't familiar with you or maybe what you talk about on your yeah. podcast, which again, you guys, if you're listening to this, you can get this anywhere that you got this podcast. It's realestateundergroundpodcast.com. If you want to go check that out as well, give people kind of like the overview of who you are and what you're doing today. Yeah. So I am a recovering technology executive. I spent about 24, almost 25 years uh, working for Silicon Valley companies that nobody's ever heard of. Cool. And I uh, had a blast, learned a lot, met some amazing people. And along the way, I started to look at real estate as a way to build generational wealth. And so, you know, I always tell people that in 2008, I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it changed my life, right? Three years later. I did, you know, it took me three years to get the gumption to to start investing in real estate. And I bought my first property in 11. And, uh, you know, over time, you know, as, as commissions came in or bonuses or a little extra money, I would save up and we started flipping houses and uh, we flipped houses and I would buy a multi and flip a few more houses and buy a multi. And pretty soon those multis added up to the point where they were basically equal with my salary from, you know, the company I was working for. And then I decided that, having a, a life was more important than than managing the career I was managing because I was traveling 150, 200 days a year. And I was missing a lot of really good stuff with my two daughters and my wife, who uh, turns out they're still fond of me and I'm awfully fond of them. So I <laughs> wanted to spend more time with them. And so we made the decision as a family to, that I would 
pursue the real estate thing, you know, full time. And so I've been doing that since 2018. Since then, we've kind of dialed down the flipping business and moved the multifamily business from a, you know, a, a Connecticut based property operator to a syndicator. And so now we've grown Clark Street properties into Clark Street Capital and uh, are now growing uh, our portfolio both in Connecticut as well as in the Midwest and Southeast. So, okay, I have a, a bunch of things I want to talk about, but That's a I want to talk about, I want to go all the way back to, you mentioned you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, very common, right? A lot of sure. real estate investors. Also Bible. Yeah, exactly, right? It's it's up there. I really want to know what secret sauce went into that book because it is, it is amazing. But the thing that I'm interested in is you said you read the book and then three years later, you started investing. So I'm wondering in that three-year gap, What were you doing? Like, what was something holding you back? Were you sort of working up the nerve? I'm curious, like, what that three year sort of interim period was like. Deep, profound fear, absolute fear. And, you know, it was fear of the unknown. It was fear of, you know, the imposter syndrome of, you know, who am I to go invest in a in a property? I, I don't know anything about this. And, you know, fortunately, I had a handful of people who either saw something in me or took pity on me. And another another local real estate investor and realtor here, uh, Amy Rio, showed me 15, 20, 30 properties with and and each one I would find something teeny tiny wrong with it. Oh, it has blue shutters. It has a stained glass window. It uh, you know, I see one of the shingles is is not quite adjusted right. And I came up with every single excuse in the, in the business, you know, that I could think of to not move forward. And uh, finally, she found a property on Clark Street, which is why I named the company this, a four unit. And she said, look, this is a very good deal. You really need to pay attention to it. And if you don't buy it, I'm done. Never call me again. And it, it, she was a little more aggressive about it, but I'm not going to swear on your, on your show. But so, you know, she, she literally put the contract down in a pen and handed it to me and said, sign this contract. This is the best deal you're going to find, you you know, right here, right now in this market. And, you know, I'm six, four and Amy is probably five, two on a, on a good day. And she scared the living daylights out of me. And I gently took the pen from her and signed it right on the hood of her car. And I still own that property today and realized that actually wasn't so bad. And wow, that began, you know, this, uh, what, 12, almost 13 year odyssey. Man, it's, it's so fascinating, right? Because the, the sort of me- the classical mentorship story is kind of like, it's a lot of like puppy dogs and rainbows and right. yada, yada, yada. She was going to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, but so much of the time, that's what you need, right? You, right. you need a kick in the rear a lot of the times. So like, like you said, we, we all have this kind of defense mechanism like you said, like the blue shutters or the stained glass window or whatever. And the thing we're going to point to is the reason we can move forward. Right. Okay. So that's absolutely fascinating. I want to talk a little bit about your background because you mentioned you were working with tech companies, right? You're hey. working with these companies that got their roots in Silicon Valley. Um, you're doing that. You did that for, uh, it was almost well, like decades. two and a half decades, right? Yeah. So, so I'm curious coming from that culture, that workplace culture, Have you brought anything from that part of your life into your real estate investing business? Are there places where you see the sort of culture of real estate investing and the culture of these kind of like tech, not necessarily startups, but these like, you know, we're startups, these sort of tech companies. Are you, there places where you see those cultures really diverge? Are they more similar? I'm just curious, like what you see as the connections or the differences. Well, I I mean, I see that both markets are very competitive, right? I mean, you know, in the technology world, you know, speed is is just about everything, right? In terms of getting to market, in terms of growing share, uh, in terms of you know, acquiring customers so that you can build a valuation to be able to then, you know, scale the business, right? Yeah. And in the real estate world, it's very similar, right? I mean, you you snooze on a deal and there are five or six other investors, even here in Connecticut, which is a really different market than, you know, some of the markets out you know, in the in the Midwest and Southeast and and elsewhere. But the fact is, is that you snooze, you lose. And so you've got to be able to very quickly find a deal, evaluate it and make a decision on it, you know, and, you know, in terms of what we do, we're trying to do that in a matter of minutes, two hours uh, in terms of at least the initial underwriting. So, yeah, I, I think that's a big thing. Um, the other thing that I think is really important and why I was actually so fired up to come on your show is that uh, you know with with regard to the technology business, fundamentally marketing business, right? Um, you're trying to establish a brand. You're trying to create awareness. 
You're trying to build rapport and a relationship with your end customer to the point where you build trust, you know, from a brand perspective, and then ultimately earn the right to do business. Real estate's the exact same thing, right? I am in the marketing business. I market to building owners and I'm trying to build a relationship with them so that when they're ready to sell their property, I'm their first phone call, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my job is to create awareness, to build that relationship, actually become friends with them. And, and then over the course of time, as I serve them and as they, you know, serve me like friends do, right? We help each other out. I build that level of trust where I earn the right to buy their property at some point. That can be a month from now, or that can be three years from now. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm looking to do, I'm looking to build that relationship and make some friends along the way. But, you know, ultimately I'm, I'm looking to, to, to acquire properties. On the investor side, same thing, right? I mean, it's a it's a giant responsibility to take on someone's capital. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, it's retirement money, yeah, and it's definitely family money, right? It's college money. It's uh, you know the, the way that they're going to pay for their future, and so it's the same thing. Create awareness. Here's what we do. Here's how we operate. Here are the values that we operate from. Build a relationship where we get to know each other and actually become friends and. And then build a level of trust as as I you know serve them and answer questions and help them get their head around a pretty big decision in their financial world. And then ultimately, when they're ready, they they invest in one of our projects. And that is entirely a marketing motion, right? Yeah. Want to find motivated seller leads online, but don't know where to start? Download our free motivated seller keyword report today. AdWords nerds have spent over $5 million this year researching the most profitable keywords for finding motivated seller leads. And you can grab these exact keywords when you download our report at www.adwordsnerds.com slash keywords. Yeah, I like you sort of described it as making friends and we're building relationships in exchange for in the future, at some point, I'm probably going to buy her. Maybe, maybe not. Right. Like it's that, that long-term mindset I think is really powerful, but I think a lot of investors, I mean, a lot of business owners, period. Right. I know I'm not picking on investors by any means, but we fall into the trap of, well, I need revenue now. I need it now. Right. I don't need it in three years. I need it now. So how, what can I do for that short-term gain? But it's ultimately those long-term strategies. I mean, I, w- I would love to talk about your podcast, but for me, doing this podcast is a long-term strategy. Same. It produces very little revenue in the short term, but over the course of the last few years, more or less all of my best clients have been like, hey, I've been listening to your podcast for a year, two years, three years, right? Like it's it builds that relationship ahead of time. It does. And, you know, people start to understand, okay, you know, Dan is a good guy and he wants to help. And he's really knowledgeable. And you start to build that knowledge base of, of the fact that you know what you're talking about. You know, you want to serve your clients and you, you know, you tend to do a good, you, you do a good job for them. And, you know, over the course of time, yeah, I mean, the, the fact is, is that, you know, with the internet and, and social media and all of that, you know, the people that we meet in our professional lives have checked us out six ways to Sunday before we even know their first name. Right. And, and so, you know, using a podcast or social media or any other media to be able to make that connection is, is so important. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's three years from now. It, it can be, I mean, I get phone calls all the time with people that just came across my profile on LinkedIn or, you know, saw something I posted on Twitter or Facebook that resonated with them for, for whatever reason. And then, you know, then it's a, a, a conversation to see if we fit. And see if, you know, the way that they operate is the way I operate. And does that fit together? And, you know, can we help? Yeah. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes we can't. I, th- I think it's one of the fundamental sort of marketing lessons, right? Like that conversation, that initial conversation is a lot easier if someone approaches you than if you are approaching someone like tapping them on the shoulder and be like, hey, by the way, I would right. love to buy your house. Like that right. can work, right? But it's just a very powerful sort of reversal there that I think you've done really well. I want to talk about your relationship building. Before we get into that, this is a bit of a diversion, but I want to touch on this while we're talking about, we were talking about your sort of time in tech. Yep. I am curious your opinion because you've been so embedded or you were so embedded in that world for so long. Yeah. Tech wise, what do you think the next five, 10 years looks like for real estate? Because the thing that I have my eye on is mostly 
artificial intelligence, this this yeah. kind of idea of, like you said, there will, I'm, if there's not this company already, there will be, hey, you plug all your property data into an AI model and it makes an offer for you, right? Like that kind of thing, I think, feels like fairly inevitable to me. I'm curious because you've been behind the scenes there a little bit. What are you kind of putting your, you know, keeping your eyes on in terms of the next five, 10 years? Or is it, eh, it's not really going to be anything. It's always going to be the same old, not necessarily the same old, but no. the core business never really changes. I, I think the world has fundamentally changed and it will continue to change every 18 to 24 months for the rest of our lives and in perpetuity, right? Yeah. Y- you know, the adapt or die thing is real. Yeah. And so I agree. I think, I think artificial intelligence, but I would actually take it one step even beyond that where- you know, where there's like lookalike audiences on Facebook, where I can, I can say that I'm looking for this person in this socioeconomic space, in this geographic area and so on and so forth. I would bet that there is, uh, and, and I think some companies do it to a certain extent, but I, I think that there's a lot of room for, for opportunity and a lot of room for growth and opportunity is to be able to create lookalike properties. Look, I own a 10 unit in Jewett city, this is the median income. This is the rent roll. This is the, you know, so on and so forth and be able to plug in. Here's exactly what this building is. Now go out and find the other 10,000 that look exactly like that building because those are the buildings I want to buy, right? And then taking it to your step of then automating the process of based on the numbers that were were created. And a lot of this is publicly available, right? With audit, you know, with annual reports and everything to be able to then turn around and offer on properties, basically sight unseen to at least start the conversation, right? Yeah. I think it's going to be a truly weird three to five year period. I'm very excited for it, but I also think it's very weird. Like literally, uh, you know, like I have a personal blog, it's not real estate related, but I write in it every week. And literally I invited it to a, a beta thing where you feed it all your past blog posts and then you write sort of like a Google doc. And if you're ever stuck to what to say, you hit plus, 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 and the AI completes like the paragraph for you in your own voice. Yep. And I was like, is this the best thing in the world or the worst thing? You yes. know what I mean? Like, it's like, no, I, I just know it is a thing in the world. So there's not much you could do about it. Um, okay. So I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole because I will literally talk your ear off. I want to talk about Connecticut a little bit. So when you okay. got started, you're in Connecticut, yeah. you know, and you've been investing in Connecticut in Connecticut now for a very long time. I mentioned well, this before when we we met sort of before we did the show was yep. that I've only had a few clients ever in Connecticut. In fact, I think Oz Pariser, I think you had on your I podcast. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it was a past client of mine also for like two years straight, just absolutely kicked my behind in jujitsu just every single day that I would yeah. ever meet him with just a bad man. You have to go, be uh, um, amazing dude. Right. So, yeah. but beyond him and like a few other people, I just like, I don't really meet investors from around here and I've never really known why. So give me your take sort of from the inside. Why is Connecticut not as, um, uh, what's a good word? I'm, it's not as popular among investors. It seems is that true? Right. And if so, why? And two, why do you view Connecticut as such a great place to invest? Like, why choose Connecticut as your market? You know, it's fascinating because Connecticut has always been, in my experience, a cash flow state, right? So it's not quite as sexy, uh, you know, you, you, as say a New York or a, or a Massachusetts or LA, you know, California or, you know, some of the other places where it's a lot more straightforward to force appreciation. But it's interesting though, because when you look at the investor population, like if you look at uh, CT Rio, right? The the entity I used to, I was uh, recently, I, I recently left, but you know, I, I I ran that for quite a bit of time with with my partners, and that Rio, the Real Estate Investor Association, is the fifth largest in the country, and I actually think it might be the fourth, and by far the most active. I mean, there's thousand members, and I had no idea. That's not that amazing. Fourth largest in the state, and it's the most active. Fourth largest in the country. Oh wow! Oh yeah! yeah. Oh yeah! I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I had no. It's idea. amazing, right? But but here's the thing. So a lot of investors want this. You know, you go on like a bigger pockets or clever investor and all those, and they're they're really interested in appreciation because that's where the big wealth comes from, right. right? Here in Connecticut, traditionally, it hasn't been true over the last eighteen months to two years where we have become a more of an appreciation market, but it's always consistently been a cash flow market where you know you could buy at a certain price point. And the rent that you charged 
you know, you could make a consistent, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars a month per door in the in the properties that you own. And, you know, the way that investors built wealth here in Connecticut was really focused on creating that cash flow to the point where it eclipsed your monthly salary, your annual salary. Boom. And then that gave you the freedom to be able to go out and do it more, more uh, you know, on a uh, on a full-time basis. Yeah, you know, that's my story, right? Yeah. And and so Connecticut isn't quite as sexy as New York, where you buy a, you know, a little brownstone in New York for, I don't know, two million bucks and you throw five hundred thousand into it and turn around and sell it for five million dollars two years later, right? Just not the way it works here in Connecticut. And so, but what's changed over the last couple of years is is COVID, right? I mean, COVID changed everything. And so you look at the opportunities within, you know, we'll use New York and Boston as as two examples, right? Where they the appreciation for a period of time, about six months stopped, just stopped. And then, you know, that money, that institutional money and kind of the next couple of tiers down poured into Connecticut, which increased the, you know, the property values. So where I could buy a, you know, a building for, I don't know, 45, 50,000 a unit today, you know, today that unit, that building is probably anywhere from 85 to a hundred thousand dollars and really nothing changed other than in time and, and demand. And so, you know, obviously that that corrected fairly quickly because everything started to appreciate. But but Connecticut, you know, it's not sexy. It's not get rich overnight type uh, type of market. It's a get rich over 15, 20 year market. Right. Yeah. And uh, and that's why it's probably, you know, you probably don't see, you know, the, the heavy hitters, you know, walking around here is is for that reason is that, you know, it takes a long time to, to build wealth in Connecticut for a real estate perspective. OK. I find that really fascinating because, again, it sort of ties back to what we were just talking about. It's like the short term versus the long term. Yep. But to a certain extent, all investing is like long term. It is. Right. But I think that sort of gradual, steady build is like to someone like me. So I would say like, I'm not an investor. I've worked with investors and have for almost a decade now, but I'm, I've never invested. And I'm like, okay, next year, my goal is I'm going to do my first real estate investing. I have no idea what. I would just I set that goal for myself. I haven't thought of that awesome. since there, right? So yeah, exactly. So I was like, okay. One of the things that to someone like me, right, is like the sort of very volatile investing turns me off because I'm like, it's not just not what I'm looking to do, right? That sort right. of slow and steady makes more sense. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed part one of this episode. It's just too good to limit to one show. Join us next week to hear the rest. This is the podcastfactory.com.